Okay, so this is our second session of First Peter. It's a very small book. It's only five chapters. Uh, last week, one of the things that we had done was kind of take an overview of the origin of the book and why we believe it is Peter who wrote this book himself. We know that he had Sylvanus, which he will state in the very end of the text. Uh, essentially, he dictated it to him to write it kind of like a stenographer would do. Um, and there was some certain historical facts that were transpiring during this time. I just want to do a real quick overview because, again, the last two chapters in this study uh, are short. So we actually will have an excess of time. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay, so I'm in. I got Shelly on speaker now, guys. So um, we're what we're doing is we're just going over a quick review of what we did last week. So you'll see some of the facts that I have here online. Things that were pulled from uh, Chuck Smith, Chuck Misler, uh, John MacArthur, and others. I had just gleaned information from them. So we're seeing that a, a time of when the city of Rome was burned, we're looking at the sometime around 64, 65 AD. And the, the Romans believed that it was their emperor Nero, that he had set the city on fire. Uh, their, the claim was because of his incredible lust to build. In order to build more, he had to destroy what existed. The Romans were totally devastated. Their culture, in a sense, went down with the city. And this was really impactful on them as well, because when you consider all of their gods burning up in the city, like what it describes here, their household idols, uh, it shows the religious implications being that the gods themselves or the deities themselves were of no power, right? And so to deal with this conflagration, uh, they were also victims as well. So we see here that the people were homeless and hopeless. Many had been killed and their bitty, bitter resentment was so severe that Nero realized he had to redirect the hostility somehow. So what better way to do that than to choose uh, the scapegoat as the Christians? They were already hated because they were associated with the Jews and because they were seen as being hostile to the Roman culture. Nero spread the word quickly that the Christians had set fires. As a result, a vicious persecution against Christians began and soon spread throughout the Roman Empire, touching places north of the of Tarsus, mountains like Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Byzantia. And so you see here, there's some references there to the first verse. Uh, the last statement here, thus the apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this epistle to strengthen them. When we ask ourselves who this was written to, Peter lays it out pretty easily. And verse 1, 1 through 2, Peter, the apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So we know the time, we know the land, we know the audience, and we're learning about the message. Where we left off last week was about women and their attire, right? But it was something much more than that, if you guys recall. So 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observed your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So we the, the latter part of this talks directly about you know, 11, essentially, 1141. essentially putting uh, jewelry and makeup and all these things to entice a suitor or something along those lines to really present how great you are when in the sight of God, I mean, women are perfect in the way that he created them. I see that you're live here now, Shelly. Can you hear us? Can you hear us on the computer? Uh, not yet. No, oh. not yet. Okay. Okay. I cut you out, Shelly, just because of the echo. So what, what are wonderful traits in the sight of God, which we can see here on the latter part, it says, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of the Lord. <coughs> God, I should say. 
So it has nothing to do with all of these fancy trinkets that you put on yourself. Um, I remember Greg Glory making a, a funny joke back in the day. He would say that, you know, many people would come to him with a position on, do you think women should wear makeup? And he always had the joke, well, if the house needs paint, paint it. And it was it always got a big rise out of the audience because it was funny, but he would refer back to something along these lines. It's, it's, it is more than that. It is the actions behind the individual. And we're going to see a theme that carries out throughout the rest of this book where it's not directed at just women, but Peter definitely addresses uh, the woman in this first part of the chapter, which is, I think is great. Um, on the latter part of this, we see, you know, the men's male husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together for the grace of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. So this was one of those things where we had ended on the dialogue where Michelle and I had had a discussion about something that she was struggling with and recognizing what she needed in that moment was a hug that goes a lot farther, you know? And so it's just, it's knowing your wife. Um, I would say Mike is that person for sure. Obviously, Miguel and Uncle Charlie, you guys, I know that you guys love your wives. You guys are great examples of good husbands. My dad was the same way. I would say he, in, in my eyes, he was the best just because he was, you know, um, so self-sacrificial when it came to that and was willing to put up with quite a bit. But um, it's... Uh, it, it's it's a great verse, especially when it comes to that. It has nothing to do with this, you know, demeaning women and being the weaker vessel. It, it's it's uplifting on both sides, one to the woman and also the second to the man on on uh, reading each other's mail, so to speak. So that gets us into the last part of chapter three, which is where we left off. I, I do believe we finished all of chapter three, but again, let's get through this last part where I have it bolded. It says, finally, all of you be of one mind, Having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So I have a couple notes here from Chuck Smith that I really liked from his study in First Peter that I'm just going to share. He writes, how many times do you read in the gospel and Jesus looked upon them and he had compassion on them and he was tenderhearted. He was a soft touch. Anybody could get to him. He was always moved by the needs of the people. And may God help us to be tenderhearted, not to become calloused or indifferent to the needs of the people around us, but that we might have tender hearts full of pity. Moving on to this section that I have highlighted here, he notes, are you stuck? Are you stuck? I got gotcha. you. All right. Okay. Gotta be quiet, okay? Um, he notes that Proverbs 15.1 has an interesting comment that really fits in here. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath. And so when we read the rest of this scripture, it says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and he hears and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So you can say hi after, baby. Okay. So um, we talked about this again last week. In, in the Bible study that we participated in Kentucky, uh, they had this whole section about victory. And we shared last week about how it's not, it's not that it's, a, oh my goodness, a prosperity gospel. It's that Christ has fulfilled the the role for us in its entirety he exactly and so it what it's not saying is that we're not going to see any type of trial or tribulation in our life we should actually expect it and it should be a wonderful thing for those who us for those of us 
who are penalized by the culture for our beliefs, when you consider what those beliefs, those actions that we are leading to, which is caring for those around us, not repaying evil for evil, it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, right? Because Peter, in instances, when he was, he didn't consider himself counted worthy to receive a beating for sharing the gospel, and they went away rejoicing. I don't know if you guys remember that. So this end part of chapter three will, again, segue into chapter four. It, 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 remember, the chapter and verses were added at a latter time, so it would generally be read all as one. So transitioning from chapter three, let's get right into this section. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to do the will of God. <clears throat> the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you not or that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. So we see in this particular passage, the, the very act of its abstaining from some of this behavior will cause the culture around you to persecute you, right? And I mean, I was... I remember sharing a video with you guys several months back where it was a woman on Fox News where she was like, I am so damn tired of you Christians. And then insert dot, 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 dot. And it had something to do with, I believe it was with abortion. Um, because she's, in, and she was very boldly uh, the antagonist of scripture for that matter. And I mean, we don't want to be those people that's jamming those things down people's throats, but we definitely want to have an we want to have a firm opinion based on scripture, right? So I have a few things right here that I want to share with you guys. I have a triple star noted on but the will of God. For but the will of God, consider the actions of Jesus as God in the flesh. The very presence of sin in the lives of those around him gave grounds for persecution, but he gave compassion. This perfect role model is how we are supposed to attempt to live out the gospel, which is precisely what Peter is saying when it came to the woman whose husband was an unbeliever. We talked about that in the beginning. Remember, she is supposed to live out the gospel in such a way through her deeds that the husband wants to recognize what's different in her. Her very deeds and actions and the way that she carries herself is a testimony to the gospel that she's received, right? Right. And so I have some notes in here for us this week. How many arguments have you turned around by being compassionate? How quickly do we have a response in the chamber? And what I mean by that is someone's making a comment to you and you and oh, you think so well you, and then insert all of the fire and anger and hatred that you have ready to just blast this person because you're not even taking an opportunity to hear what they're saying. Okay. So Here's my little side notes. Our best testimony of our faith is in fact our walk. It is truly what we are doing that is visible to those that are around us. With that being said, how are you conducting yourself? Take some time this week to do some self-evaluation. I know that many of us are surrounded by good people in our life. And I, I have a little personal application here from this last trip to Kentucky. So I know that many of us are surrounded by good people in our life. And yet when Michelle and I visited Kentucky, we're taken back by the hospitality, the welcomeness, and the genuineness of the people. Yeah, I'll leave that at that. So would people see this in you when you are being railed with false accusations? So let's say someone's lighting you up for something that you know is wrong. Are they seeing someone that's kind and compassionate on the other end when it's not deserved? We've, we've talked about this analogy that I gave about that guy that cuts you off and you go to coffee, so on and so forth. It, it, it is that same 
essence in this line, in these lines right here. So if you're not doing that, do it, pray, think. And the reason being, as we just learned in Proverbs 15, it says, because a soft answer turns away wrath. Uh, I just wanted to touch on one word here, the lasciviousness. Uh, because Michelle had asked the question, hey, what does that word mean? I wanted to Google it because I figured it would come up before, but it's filled with or showing sexual desire, lewd, lustful, or throwing off the throwing off of any type of sexual restraint. So when we see that in that line, it says, for in times path, past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of, and remember Gentiles is also the word pagans, when we walked in sexual lewdness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So, verses 6 through 11. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The first part of this scripture says, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. I can't help but be reminded of other passages that talk about Jesus descending and then ascending. And this very well could be a reference to that. There are other individuals and scholars who come up with a, a different conclusion that in my opinion, doesn't really fit. I brought them up just so you guys have the information, but it says been preached even to those who are dead, signifying those individuals that during their life, lifetime, the gospel was preached through those who are now dead or martyred for faith in Christ, and that though they are judged in the flesh as people, these believers died as all people do. They may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Because of the gospel, these martyrs live forever according to God's purpose. So this particular person is taking it as... This is individuals who were once dead, obviously without Christ, and you know after that are alive in Him, so on and so forth. But it's just unique the way that it's written because it drew it immediately in my head had dropped flags about the time what we read about Christ preaching to the dead, right? So the other part that I highlight here is be ye therefore sober. So a lot of conversations transpire around alcohol. And I'll give you what I believe is a biblical opinion on alcohol. Excess is a problem. And what I mean by that is I truly believe that if Jesus didn't want us to drink ever, then he wouldn't have turned water into wine. That's my stance on that. But there are countless scriptures that talk about people not to be drunk because our, the, the, the enemy that we have right? Our battle is with powers and principalities of the air, right? So you have to be right-minded. And when you're hammered drunk, your inhibitions are loosened, your thought process is far gone, and you make mistakes. And it's easy for the enemy to attack you. And especially if you have weaknesses in areas, that's one of those things that can be a problem. So when we see here, be ye therefore sober, I think it literally means be ye therefore sober. And can you be sober and still have a drink? I think you can, but it's, you need to find that balance. It's not about having 25 beers and say, you know, I've got a really high tolerance. I think I'll be fine. No, that's that you're, I think there's a missing the point there. 
it's it's be watchful be ready be of sound mind right so that's what i got there and what do i have here that's right levi Okay, so I have this highlighted here. It says, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. And I have a reference here from Proverbs 10, 12 that came up on Esword. It says, fervent charity, or no, no, I'm, I should say. Okay, so... Scale that back for a second. Fervent charity in many translations is the word love. And this statement has a close resemblance to a passage in Proverbs, which says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. <laughs> well, that's Proverbs 10, 10, 12, right? How can love co cover all sins? What, what is the greatest love? Okay. And what is agape love, babe? If you were to sum it up in one Bible verse, what would it be? which says, okay, right there. And what did Jesus's death do? Provide a, a covering of all sins. of all sins. So we can see a reference here back to Proverbs and uh, essentially to John 3, 16, which would, you know, essentially validate the statement. And above all things have fervent charity, love among yourselves for love shall cover a multitude of sins, and it most certainly did. Uh, the last part, right, right here, it says, manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as <laughs> ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And I have a little side note for here for myself. But um, it's a reminder for me continually, it's not about me or the way that I articulate or if I'm leading this meeting or if it's somebody else, it is enough that it's the gospel. And my goal to you guys is not to, you know, to articulate myself in such a way that you're like, wow, this is really good. It's that it's God's wonder, not mine. And so the, the greatness of this statement is that the gospel that you are getting, no matter who it comes from, I should say, is going to give glory to God. And I think that we all speak in different ways and, and we have a, a different route in which we do things. And there is an ear for each of us. There are certain things that click with some more than others. And, you know, it's, it's just, it was a great verse. Uh, 12 through 19, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Okay, so we talked about, I, I just like to play on words here because if we think back to Rome burning and the fact that they're being falsely accused for for essentially if they're on trial for a fire, right? Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice and as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be not reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer. Okay. So we're going to see a transition here in this latter statement, right? How wonderful it is it if you're being persecuted for the words of Christ. That's great because you're living it out. Who was our example of that? Jesus. Jesus was the best example of that. Great job, Levi. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. But now he's going to say, don't be this guy who's like, oh, yeah, no, I stole from someone, but I'm totally being persecuted and I'm a Christian. This is ridiculous, you know? So we'll see. We'll see it. We'll see it here, right? He says, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, I'm sorry, let me go up one, but let none of you suffer 
as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So I just, in the side notes I have here, this is a great example of trials. And in this description, a trial that is unto death in the flesh, we are given an example, and that example is Jesus. Um, my last note I have on this slide is, on the flip side of this, we are, we are told not to suffer for the reason that is actually due punishment. Don't steal and go to jail and then rejoice in the punishment as if, it, as if it's part of your fate. So definitely don't do that. <laughs> That's right. You don't pass go and collect $200 either, do you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So I'm going to read this in the, the New King James Version instead of the um, original. It says, being lords over those who entrusted you, but being examples to the flock. I think this is an important concept. When you go to church and have elders, it's important to know the role of these persons. And it is well described above. They are not to be rulers, but leaders through example, setting the tone visually, right? We don't worship these people that we go to church to hear God's word from but we do identify their actions as whether or not they're living out what they believe. And so that's what we're called to be. We're, we're, we're called to be an example to those around us. And that has been a strong emphasis starting all the way from with the woman through the husband, so on and so forth. That's right. That's right. Good job, Levi. Verses five through 11. Likewise, you younger people, who do you think that is? Yeah, you are a younger person. Submit yourselves to your elder. Who's your elder? Who's older than you? There we go. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Why? For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him for he cares for you guess what guys guess what we're gonna see here be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world but may the god of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffer, suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, or I should say perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Good job. So, I have, we have a reference here in this particular scripture where we see that all caps and it's out of Isaiah 57, 15, which is what we just got out of, right? For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Moral of the story through that, 
be humble. I think we could all gather that from that first, that, that scripture right there, right? But I wanted to note here, the last time that I'm, I'm going to talk about being sober, I did a word search on that word sober, and I counted 10 references in the New Testament <laughs> about being sober, four of which were words in red. And what does it mean when it's words in red? That's right. And so what is he saying? Be, be sober. Be, there we go. Um, there you go. And I was going to ask you the question, what do you think that means at face value? You, very good. Don't be a drunkard. Why? Because the devil is out there and seeking to take advantage. Very good. All right. Well, Michelle gets the gold star for the week, guys. I don't know where y'all at. <laughs> Let's finish the last two verses. By Sylvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein you stand. The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. And so do Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So in the very beginning of the book, we talked about the authorship where Peter had said that these were his exact words. We talked about the time period. We talked about his audience. And here we could see that the person who transcribed essentially what he was saying was Sylvanus. Um, and that is the end of first Peter. And that's actually the end of Bible study. And I don't know what time it's 638. I was going to let you guys know that next week by popular vote of one that we are going to be getting into numbers and uh nice job that if you could get through the first five chapters to be prepared for next week's study, these chapters are lengthy. They're, they're pretty long. And uh, we will start reading those together next week. Oh, I switched to uh, Peter 2. What's that, sir? We didn't do uh, the second epistle of Peter. We're not doing that one? We're going to save that one. Okay. I'd like to continue to alternate between Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. That's good. Like so... It. That way we, because we, we've actually, we've blown through a lot of these, but well, we this is our third year. So um, we've covered quite a few of the books of the Bible, but I would say that we have definitely covered more in the New Testament. So I'm going to try and split it up. Um, did you guys have any questions on first Peter? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to stop this real quick on the sharing.